hello and welcome out once again to your Wednesday night Bible study. This is Pastor Josh. Hope you are having just a great week, great week. This past Sunday, Father's Day Sunday, what a great, tremendous time we had in the presence of God out in the parking lot. And what a great opportunity this is to come together virtually. I want to thank you for just joining us and being with us during this time when we're, you know, still doing the shelter in place as best you can. And, um, you know, going through <laughs> unparalleled times. You know, one of the things that I'm having to learn is to continually guard my gates. And you've heard me say that phrase often. I find myself getting pulled away by distractions. I find myself getting pulled away by, uh, man, different opinions and people talking. And guys, sometimes we just got to cut out the white noise and the chaos, the confusion, right? And just uh, begin to sit in the presence of our Heavenly Father. So let's do that now. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you, and we bless you today. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we set down every care and every worry, every concern, anything that would try to exalt itself against the knowledge of you. Father, we rip it off, we shred it in the name of Jesus. We say, you got no place, you got no room, you got no right here. And so we're getting rid of you, God. We repent of all that, man, the negativity and the, just the, the googly gob and the garbage, oh God. How many times do we get drawn away, Father, by those things? So, Heavenly Father, we just, yeah, we ask that you would wash us, cleanse us, purify us, God. Just as you were, Jesus, you taught the disciples to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And, Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debts against us. And then God, and then God, and then God, lead us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, Heavenly Father, from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, that's just resounding on the inside of me this evening, God, that we would not be led into temptation. God, we know that you would never lead us into temptation. But Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that, that it's not enough, God, that we not be led into temptation, but uh, this evening, God, lead us away from temptation. As David writes, lead us beside those still waters. Let your rod and your staff, Heavenly Father, let them comfort us, I pray, in the name of Jesus, so that we might be, we might find that peace, that joy, that strength, and uh, those green pastures, uh, those still waters, God, that our soul, our heart, our will, our emotions would no longer be troubled by the cares, the worries, and the concerns of this world, that God would fix our eyes on you. Jesus, on you, on you, on you, on you, on you, on you tonight. We declare holy, holy, holy. Come on, church. Just begin to worship him with me. Holy, holy, holy Lord. You are great, greatly to be praised. Tonight we're going to be going into Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah is in the temple on the Lord's day and man he just suddenly has this experience with almighty God and the seraphim did fly around the throne and they declared holy 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 is the Lord of hosts so we declare we declare tonight that holy 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 it is the Lord of hosts the Lord God almighty huh the line of the tribe of Judah, the balm of Gilead, you are good, you are great. You are greatly to be praised in all the heavens and all the earth. There is none like you. There is none, there is none, there is none like you. Oh, come on, just let that presence, let the presence of the Holy Spirit just rest. Just rest on you. Rest on you, rest on you, rest on you, rest on you. Holy, 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 holy. Worthy, 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 worthy are you, Lamb of God, worthy. You are great. Come on, right there it is, right there it is. Find your peace in God's presence. Yeah, we love you, Lord. <coughs> Our 
our love for you. Tonight, O oh God. There is none who is like unto you. Father, we could search high and low, and we would never find, never find a God that is like unto our God. Oh. So right now, we just, we proclaim our undying love to you, our King of glory. King of glory, King of glory, ni taro so ye le te andana se. A King of glory, ni andana se. King of glory, King of glory, King of glory. We love you, 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 we love you. We love you, Lord, and we bless you. Thank you for your presence in this place tonight, O oh God. Father, we open our hearts to receive from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Greet one another with a holy hug and a handshake around your living room. Hallelujah. Well, hello and welcome once again out to your weekly Bible study here at Cliffdale. Uh, before we jump into the word tonight, I want to go over just a couple of announcements real quick. Um, as you know, of course, uh, the children's ministry, they are pausing um, doing the virtual church with the children's ministry. It's been very effective, very good. But listen, when we do this, it is very extensive, very time consuming. And so I asked Brian and Aunt, Pastor Brian and Angie, um, you know, to maybe pause that for just a couple of weeks, but we'll get back on it um, as we progress through the summer. Uh, number one, and actually I'm doing that with uh, virtually everything, guys. We have been hitting this thing hard for the past three months during the uh, duration of the pandemic. So our food bank team, um, if you're an individual here in our congregation, you need help, then of course reach out to us and we'll be very happy to help you. But we're not doing any of our main distributions um, and our outreach team is not doing any of their Saturday outreaches right now. Just gonna give us a couple weeks rest and then we'll jump back into it full bore once again. As always, if you're an individual who is in need of prayer, um, our prayer warriors would love the opportunity to be able to pray with you. Our hope line is 910. 273-6372. That's 910-273-6372. And they would love the opportunity of being able to pray with you, uh, whether it's salvation, healing, um, whatever, whatever it is that you need prayer for, they would love the opportunity to be able to pray with you. That's number one. And then number two, um, be sure to join us daily on Facebook Live um, as we do your daily Devo and prayer. We're seeing God just do so many things um, through that daily devotional, so many lives being touched and impacted through that. So uh, usually I, I, I jump on around 1, 2 o'clock. Um, and so, yeah, uh, make sure you try to come out and join us virtually on Facebook, Facebook Live daily for your daily Devo. Uh, as always, if you'd like to give to Cliffdale, um, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. You can go to www.cliffdalealive.com and um, go to the donate button, top right hand corner, hit that, follow the prompts and you'll be able to give that way. Um, of course, you can do the text to give at 910-499-4749. That's 910-499-4749, and you'll be able to do, again, just follow the prompts. It's for real, very simple. Um, if you prefer mailing a check, you can mail a check to 6427 Cliffdale Road, Fayetteville, North Carolina, 28314. That's Cliffdale Christian Center, 6427 Cliffdale Road, Fayetteville, North Carolina, 28314. And as always, Ms. Barbara, uh, 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 Wilson is here daily at our preschool between uh, 9 and 3, and you can drop that off Monday through Thursday, and yeah, you can give that way. Uh, anyway, that being said, those are the ways you can give, so how about we go ahead and get those tithes and offerings ready to bring to the Lord tonight. Go ahead and take that, just lift it up. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, we bless you tonight. God, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would take these gifts, take these tithes, take these offerings, God. Um, Use them, Heavenly Father, for your glory, God, that your kingdom might be seen, that your kingdom might come, your will might be done um, on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you, God, that you have afforded us the opportunity to be able to give into your kingdom. What an opportunity that is, God, to be able to sow and see that vast reward that we, uh, we're not laying up riches on this earth, but God, we are laying up our treasure in heaven where moth does not eat and rust does not corrode. Thank you for that opportunity this evening, oh God, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. All right, guys, listen, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the word. Um, as you know, of course, we have been talking lately about unified diversity. I find this to be a topic that is very um, uh, at great need during this season, um, during this time. It's something 
um, to be able to realize, you know what, uh, whether we're talking red, yellow, black, white, male, female, um, whether we're talking about people from China or Thailand or Ethiopia or U United States, South America, where, wherever, whatever, how, no matter the language, um, we all have the opportunity of being one culture. We all have the opportunity of, of having one heritage and one language, uh, one color. And uh, yet we are diverse. We are united in his kingdom. And my friends, really, that is what will stand the test of eternity, is the kingdom of almighty God. And how do we do that? What does that look like here at Cliffdale? Well, I'll go ahead and give you a quick review. Um, you know this already, but by loving God, loving others, loving the world. Who are we? Cliffdale. What are we? Ecclesia. What do we do? We win souls. We make disciples. We believe in passionate praise, intimate worship, purpose-filled prayer, and being washed in the water of the word. My friends, these are things that we love. These are things where we find at Cliffdale our, our identity. And uh, as we just begin to, to consider those things, one portion of scripture that just kind of reverberates on the inside of me, um, and I preach probably a couple of times a year, and, and every time I preach it, I get something new, or several new things in this case, from it. Um, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6, and basically what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to read the whole of Isaiah 6 to you. It says this, it says, beginning in verse 1, in the, king, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above stood seraphim, each have, having six wings. With two wings they covered their face, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they did fly. And one cried to another, and they declared, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and behold, uh, or he said, and he said, behold, this has touched your lips; your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, "Whom shall I send, and who will go for us?" Then I said, "Here am I, Lord, send me." And he said, "Go and tell this people: keep on hearing, but not understanding; keep on seeing, but not perceiving; make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy." and their eyes shut, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. Verse 11. Then I said, Lord, for how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid to waste and without inhabitants. The houses are without man. The land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away and have forsaken the places, or in the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. In verse 13. But yet in the tenth, <clears throat> but yet in the tenth, or but yet a tenth will be in it, and I will and sorry and will return and be for consuming, as a Telberneth tree and as the oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down. So the holy seed shall be its stump. Heavenly Father, we come before you now in the name of Jesus. Father, we open our hearts to receive from your word. God, as we are Cliftdale, as we are Ecclesia, as we win souls and as we make disciples, as we praise passionately, worship intimately, pray purposefully, and washed in the word, God, as we love you, as we love others, as we love the world, God, cause us to cultivate, realize, come to a deeper understanding that we are each different, and that is okay. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, the eye can't say to the nose, can't say to the mouth, can't say to the ear. Um, we are all diverse. We are all different. And we, God, you have made us for specific purposes in your kingdom. So at the end of this talk, at the end of this, this time of teaching, God, I pray that our hearts would come to the place of saying, Here am I, Lord, send me. Wherever you would have me to go, whatever you would have me to do, Father, let me walk in that I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 
All right, guys, let's begin to cut this up a little bit because what we see really taking place here in Isaiah chapter 6, we, it's basically broken down into three, three parts. And number one, conviction. Number two, cleansing. And number three, the call. We see that it is the year that King Uzziah dies. And understand that the average lifespan for an individual during this time was 35 to 40 years. But King Uzziah had reigned for 52 years. And here in the United States, we have a president for four years, sometimes for eight years. And the reality of it is, after that, that individual can no longer, we'll say, quote, unquote, reign. Uh, we've had good presidents. We've had bad presidents. In the course of my life, I've probably lived through five, six, seven, eight presidents. But an individual in this time might have lived their entire life under the king, Uzziah. Uh, people have lived and died, and their ruler had never changed. This may have had been leading. And, you know, it's one thing to have a, a king that has reigned for 52 years, and you'd be praying, you know, for his passing because he's a bad king. He's a terrible king. But that's not the case with King Uzziah. King Uzziah was a good king. He was a king who sought after the Lord. Now, I'm not saying he didn't make some mistakes. Perhaps he did. But understand that overall, his rule was, was stellar. He was a military leader. Uh, he had seen many victories. <clears throat> he became uh, king at the age of 16. The word of God says that he did right in the eyes of God. Um, but man, ah, oh, goodness, the old testament the, the law where the truly 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 the wages of sin is death and second chronicles 26 that he trans we see that he transgresses against the lord that he enters the temple of the lord to burn incense on the altar of incense um that was not dedicated it was it was a uh, uh, uh unpurified un un unholy un uncleansed and uh and, and and because of this he was bringing what's called like a false fire before the lord and suddenly we see uh, in response that God strikes Uzziah with leprosy. He's in isolation as a leprosy or as a leper until his death. Um, but like I said, this man had reigned for 52 years. He'd been a good ruler. But the nation at this point, uh, to say the least, is, is shaken. I, I can kind of almost equate it to, um, you know, uh, the monarch in England right now, Queen Elizabeth. Um, she's been the queen uh, for a long time, the longest reigning in history. Uh, you can be sure at the time of her passing, if, unless Jesus comes back, at the time of her passing, um, nationally, it is going to rock the nation. Um, uh, people will be mourning. Uh, people will be sorry. They'll be grieving. Uh, people will be distraught. They'll, they'll wonder what they're going to do or how they're going to do it. I don't know if you remember when uh, Princess Diana, when she passed, people were, were grieved, this individual that they didn't even know, but yet they grieved for her. Well, imagine this. King Uzziah has reigned for 52 years. He... Um, is tragically, uh, I don't want to say tragically because it was the hand of God because of the act of disobedience in Uzziah's life. He's smitten. Bam. Whether we agree or disagree with it, that's the reality of darkness versus light. Um, that's the, uh, you know, sin versus purity. Uh, that is the reality of the wages of sin being death. Uh, Uzziah experiences that firsthand and and now the nation is left to kind of pick up the pieces. And I imagine even Isaiah, he's a prominent man, even at this point in his life. He comes from a, a good family. And here he is, uh, you know, Uzziah has passed. And so he is in the temple on the Lord's day, perhaps a little distraught, perhaps um, wondering what was going to take place with the nation, perhaps who would reign next. Would he be a good king, a bad king, and what all of this would look like? And, he, and it says that he was in the temple on the Lord's day. Ah, and then he sees the Lord. Woo. A couple of things I want to bring out about Isaiah seeing the Lord. Number one um, is the location where the Lord is. He is sitting on his throne. And I think that it's interesting, unique, that God is sitting, uh, uh, he's sitting on his throne at this point. Because Uzziah is no longer sitting on his throne. But he has now passed, and now that throne is vacant. But we can know this, as Isaiah is in the temple of the Lord on the Lord's day, he sees the Lord seated upon his throne because not death nor life, nothing can separate, nothing can take the Lord off of his throne. We can rest in the surety and the knowledge that God sits on his throne. And we're going to talk about which portion of the Godhead in just a little while. But know this, that whether we're talking Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, they cannot be removed from their throne of authority. Nothing past, nothing present, nothing in the future can, get, can, can, can take away from the authority 
and the sovereignty, the power of Almighty God. So we see God, right? Isaiah has this vision of God sitting on his throne in power, in glory, realizing that this throne in heaven uh, that our Heavenly Father sits on declares his sovereignty over everything, over literally everything. And the word of God says that he is high and lifted high and lifted up, that his throne is exalted, that it's majestic. It, I can only imagine, I mean, just the sight of this thing. And, and then we get the visibility, right? Uh, God sitting on his throne, the throne high and lifted up, that sovereignty, that power, that strength, that authority just emanating from this place. And then to kind of polish off this beautiful picture of, uh, of God sitting on his throne, we see the, his, his uh, what's it called, his train, uh, his robe literally filling the temple. It is great, it is long, it is glorious, and it fills the whole place. Uh, you know, that train, um, man, there's so many types and shadows when we look at the train. Um, it, it, the train is uh, like a robe, right? It can symbolize things like anointing, mantle, um, it, it can symbolize, it symbolizes uh, the power of God, the authority of God, the sovereignty of God. Uh, again, that, that, that anointing, that mantle, we see, uh, you know, just a great example of that in Elijah and Elisha. When Elijah's caught up into heaven on the chariot of fire, he had told Elisha, if you see me when I pass, um, then you will get what you want, that double portion. Elisha watches Elijah taken up. His mantle falls to the earth. His train, his, the, the, his robe falls to the earth. Elisha picks it up, walks to the Jordan River, smacks the waters of the Jordan River. They part. He crosses over on dry ground. And I, so, so, so that understand that when we're talking about a train, this is not just a, a garment that we're talking about, um, but it is, it is what it represents is even so much more in the train of his anointing, of his influence, it literally is filling the temple. And, and it goes on because, ah, oh, and I want you guys to grab this because it's so good, it's so good. The train of the Lord is filling the temple and then Isaiah begins to look up and he sees two seraphim standing above the throne. And uh, with two of their wings, they're covering their eyes. With two, they're covering their feet. And with two, they are flying. And this is such a, a beautiful uh, picture of these seraphim, these angelic beings. Actually, seraphim means the burning one. So we know that that they're literally emanating this this light. I, I, I consider, uh, you know, the story of the risen Savior, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, where um, literally the glory of God is being seen through these burning ones, through these seraphim. But even yet, in all of their power, right, in all of their strength, even in the glory that is reflected, the glory of God that is reflecting through them, we see something that's so key and so beautiful here. Because with two of their wings are covering their face. This is an act of contrition and humility before Almighty God. They're covering their face and saying, though I am a burning one, though I, I uh, reflect the glory of God, I am not the glory of God. And so I overshadow my face. With two of their wings, they're covering their feet. And again, the symbolism here, it's just magnificent. They're saying, I, I, am, I am paying my obeisance to Almighty God who's sitting on the throne. Even though I'm a shining one, I'm going to do these acts of contrition and humility because of the greatness, the sovereignty of the one who's sitting on the throne. So we see two-thirds of their wings, right, is in obeisance, is in humility, submission to the Father. Their third, the other last one-third, right, with their other two wings, they're flying around. They're, so I'm in obeisance, humility to God, right, and then with my other two wings, I'm in action for him. And as they are in action for him, we see them making declarations. Pay attention to this. Ah, oh, there's so much uh, prophetic insight type shadows that are here. I'm paying that obeisance. I'm acting on behalf of God. And then check this out. What are they saying? They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, right? But they're not saying it to God. They're making this declaration to one another. One seraphim is calling to the other seraphim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And that one is billowing back, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord of hosts. The power, the reverberation in this. I mean, literally, guys, as they are making this declaration to one another, and, and before I go into uh, uh, why they're making it, let me just say, uh, uh, or, or, or what's taking place while they're making it, um, they're making this declaration to one another, not to the one who is sitting on the throne. The one who is sitting on the throne, he has full realization 
of who he is. But they are declaring to one another, man, he is holy. Yes, he is holy. Yes, he is holy. Yes, he is holy. This is an act of praise and worship. This is what we do when we enter into the sanctuary. We lift up our hands to God. You've heard me say how many times before, guys, right? God does not become a bigger, better, greater God when we give him praise. He delights in our praise. He delights in our worship. Part of the purpose of praise is not so God would have a greater realization of who he is, but that we would have that greater realization of who he is. That we would declare to one another, Joe, holy, 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 Sally, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. And I believe even though these burning ones were already reflecting the glory of God as they declare the holiness of who he is, as they declared to one another the complete totality of who he was, I believe they reflected an additional level of God's glory because that's what takes place. When we praise, when we worship, as we declare holy, we come to a greater realization of that holiness. As we come to the greater realization of that holiness, we reflect a greater level of his glory. My friends, there is something in passionate praise and in intimate worship so, so, good. Huh. Ooh, and as these seraphim guys, as they're praising, as they're worshiping, as they're declaring, look at the impact that it begins to have. Look at what begins to take place as these angels are cover, or as these angels are declaring, as they're crying to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, right? Uh, before we jump into what they, I, I am going to get into the pillar shaking and all that, but there's there's a couple of things I, I still got to bring out. I forgot about. Uh, number one is why three holies? Holy, 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 holy. Well, most theologians believe, and I agree with them, is that there's a holiness ascribed to God the Father, a holiness ascribed to God the Son, and a holiness ascribed to God the Holy Spirit. And so the seraphim are declaring, "Holy is the Father." Holy is the Son. Holy is the Holy Spirit. But not just are they ascribing, identifying the, the, the Trinity, the three parts of the Godhead, but in um, Hebrew literature and writing, when something would be described, say, three times, then it had an infinite impact. So when I declare something is holy, 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 what I'm saying about that thing, it is infinitely holy. If I say... He is good, good, good. Then I'm declaring that he is infinitely good. It's not just saying that thing three times, but when I declare it three times, I'm saying that it is infinity, that it knows no bounds. It is further and farther. It's greater. It is more. And as their voices are billowing and declaring holy, 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 at the sound, huh, the pillars begin to shake. The room begins to Fill with smoke again. Get the picture of what Isaiah is seeing here. God sitting on his throne. In his majesty. In his sovereignty. Uzziah had died. No longer living in his own majesty or his own sovereignty. Right? Uh, perhaps Isaiah. Perhaps the nation. And I believe. Yes, Isaiah. And I believe the nation. Because we'll see it in Isaiah's response to the presence of Almighty God in just a moment. But they were, they were, there was anxiety. There was angst. Much like today. Uh, much like the things that we are seeing in a, a, a nation with a high level of chaos, pandemic, racial injustice, rioting, all of this stuff, right? Listen, in the midst of all of this, I, I want to just challenge you in the name of Jesus. Don't get your eyes on the circumstances and situations of this world. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Keep your gar gates guarded. It is imperative and it's, it is necessary, especially at this time that we do not allow any foul, ugly thing into our gates. You heard me say it last week. Those things that we allow into our gates will dictate what is birth. Those things that we allow into our gates at the point of conception will dictate what comes to birth, whether it will be good, whether it will be evil. Isaiah is having this vision. The power of God, the power of the seraphim, the shaking of the pillars, the smoke, the train, oh, the glory, the shaking. Ina, the kavod of Almighty God. Isaiah. I mean, I just picture it, right? His, in the midst of that glorious presence, his knees probably just buckle. He, he falls to the ground. He begins to weep. He says, Woe is me, I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a people of unclean 
clean lips. I said a few minutes ago that I was going to go into uh, not just the effect that Uzziah's death had had on Isaiah, but the nation. Uh, I think that we're seeing a portion of that right here with Isaiah saying, hey, this isn't just me. But literally, it is me. I have been affected by this. Perhaps I'm walking in fear and perhaps in doubt. I'm not being strong and courageous as God and Moses had commanded Joshua to be. But I am in fear and I'm in angst, much like the people here in the United States are today. Uh, feeling that, and he says, I recognize that, that this is not just something that's in me, but this is a nationwide thing. And literally, you've got to understand what's taking place on the inside of Isaiah at this point. Because as Isaiah is experiencing the presence of holy God. And I mean that with H-O-L-Y and W-H-O-L-L-Y. He is holy entirely, but he is also holy, consecrated, pure God. And Isaiah is experienced that. He falls, begins to, I have to weep. Woe is me, for I am this sinful man placed in the presence of almighty God is being ripped apart. I believe that this is something similar to probably what Peter felt. When he had been fishing all night, Peter and Jesus came into his boat and begins to minister to the multitudes. He says to Peter, you know, uh, let's go out. But Master, we've been fishing all night. We've not caught anything. Peter, let's go out. They go, they go out. They, he says, throw your nets on the right side of the boat. You guys know the story. They bring in a plethora of fish. And then Peter falls down on his knees, realizing that he's in the presence of somebody holy. He says, depart from me, Jesus, for I am a sinful man. I believe that, that, at that even Jesus, not in his heavenly form, but in his earthly form, being in the presence of Jesus, Peter came to the realization, woe is me, I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. The sight, the sound, the seraphim, huh, all of these things have an impact on Isaiah, just as they had had an impact on Peter. And when we, we, we see the impact, I won't understand. Isaiah enters the presence, or enters into the temple, the presence of God falls. Isaiah's gates, his eye gate, his ear gate, his mouth gate, are, are just, I mean, undone by the presence of God. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. My, my, the gate of my lips is unclean. I realize perhaps, uh, huh, and this is so good, you've got to take hold of this. Why did he specifically point out the gate of his lips? Because it is from the abundance of the heart that the mouth does speak. But the mouth doesn't speak what's not in the heart. How does that thing come to get into the heart? Understand we have entrance gates, we have exit gates. Things come in through here, they come in through here, they enter into here, and they come out here. This is the final product. The final product of what we've let come in here and we've let come in here will take root down here, and the fruit of it will be exposed by what's coming out right here. So Isaiah is able to identify the fruit that's coming out of my lips, out of the, the lips of everybody in the nation, is unclean. And the reason why it's unclean is because we've allowed things to come into here and to here, take root in here, and now it's being exposed here. It's being exposed in the glory, the presence of Almighty God. Hmm. Friends, those things that we have allowed in here, allowed in here, will come take root in here and then come from here. So if we take a step back, and we look at what comes out of here, it will let us know what's taken root in here. And we know what's taken root in here by what we've allowed into here. It's kind of like stinky breath. Sometimes we may not know that this is rotten, but those around us may be smelling that, that, that ah, rotten fruit, that pork, nasty, ugh, wretched fruit. And I think that that is what Isaiah is seeing. His own wretchedness, right, is being displayed. He's like, I've identified it. I've seen it. I know. And all my gates have been taking in sin and shame and guilt. And friends, I'm not just talking about Isaiah from, from thousands of years ago. I'm talking about our world, our society, but not just our world and our society. Because sinners are going to sin. That's what they do. But when I begin to see 
those in the body of Christ. And there are so many in the body of Christ today who I can identify and I can say, your gates have gone unguarded. And the way I know your gates have gone unguarded is because of what's coming out your mouth. What's coming out your mouth is sin. It's shame. It's ugly. And that tells me what's taking root in your heart. And I can tell what's taking root in your heart by what comes out your mouth. And that thing that's taking root in your heart has come in through your ear gate and through your eye gate. Hmm. Huh. And it is evident. How do I know? How, 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 how is it so evident? Hmm. It is so evident because I see so many people step on your toes a little bit. I love you. I'm sorry, but not. I see so many individuals preaching, teaching, talking, discussing so many kingdoms, but very few of them are the kingdom of God. They proclaim they're saved, that they're Christian, but they are not living, act, acting, talking, walking a kingdom lifestyle. I, I mean, let's just be real, friends. Well, what do we see in our society today? We see so many people living a male lifestyle or a female lifestyle or a confused lifestyle where they don't know which they are. We see many people uh, throughout the day today living a lifestyle and taking hold of their American culture, right? Don't tear down the statues, grr. And then we see many other people saying, grr, tear down the statues. And I see so many in, in, in the body of Christ. And listen, when I see sinners do this, it doesn't uh, dishearten me. It's when I see individuals in the body of Christ doing this that I begin to be disheartened. Because what they're doing, I'm not saying that one side's good and the other side's evil. Or that really, 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 I'm going to step on your toes. If it's not God's side, then it's already evil. Love you. Mean it. That's the truth of it. You know, we, we hear these catchphrases today. Um, black lives matter. White lives matter. All lives matter. And we see these signs all being taken. And guys, I, I'm just going to be real with you for a moment it brings me back to Joshua. He's walking in the valley of Jericho. Huh. He comes upon a warrior. And he says, are you for us? Joshua speaks to this warrior and says, are you for us or are you against us? And the warrior says, neither. For I am the captain of the hosts of the army of God. Now take off your shoes, son, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Immediately, Joshua rips off his shoes and bows down. That's what Isaiah is doing here. I am undone. I realize. I realize. I recognize. I see. I know that I am a man of unclean lips. And I live amongst a nation of people with unclean lips. Hear me, friends. This may sound like a very condemning and hard word. But, ah, repentance is not a bad thing. The realization of what we've been doing wrong this is not a bad thing and i'm not here to criticize i'm not here to condemn i'm hoping i'm hoping i'm hoping that we'll come to the point of repentance listen i desire to be a better kingdom individual tomorrow than i was today but the only way i'm going to do that is if i realize if i recognize if i put myself in the presence of almighty god if i allow his train to fill this temple if i allow his angelic burning ones to declare on the inside of this temple, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Ooh. Mm. That brings about change. And brings about repentance. We have this such a, just a, oftentimes a terrible misconception of repentance. Huh. We think that repentance means we've done something wrong. We think that repentance means um, that we have fallen short. I'm going to just go ahead and cue you in. I love you. You fall short every day. That's not a, a word of criticism. It's that's a fact. That you mess up. You make mistakes every day. And listen, the worst thing we can do when we mess up, we make a mistake, is to pretend like it's all okay. I pretend like our mistake really wasn't a mistake. Isn't that what the world does to say that sin's not really sin? Darkness isn't really darkness? Hurt isn't really hurt and pain isn't really pain? That's what they do. They put their blinders on and play make-believe. Play pretend. I will not allow that to take place. 
You will see my eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, the author, the finisher. You will see my eyes continue to be fixed on his kingdom. And every time we, you and I, as Cliffdale, as Ecclesia, as those who are winning souls and making disciples, every time I begin to see individuals on the inside of this tribe and this body who begin to preach anything other than the kingdom of God, then I'm just going to remind you, remember, before we're anything, we're kingdom believers. First and foremost, that may offend you, but that is what Cliffdale is. That's what we're going to do, and that's how it's going to remain. Isaiah, woe is me, I am undone, for I'm, I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a nation of individuals with unclean lips. I am a sinful man, and my sin has made itself known in the presence, the purity of a perfect God. Hmm. Allowing those things, right, <clears throat> to reverberate on the inside of us. I, you know, I think of the times throughout the Word of God where God has made His presence known to individuals like Moses. The example of Job. Man, <clears throat> Job's been knocked down, beat around, right? His friends have condemned him, tell him that he's a sinner, messed up, made mistakes. That's why God's mad at him. And then God says uh, to Job, Who is this who darkens my counsel with words without wisdom? Ooh. Who is this who dares to come into my presence who has words but has no knowledge, who perhaps know about, but do not know. Where were you, Job? When I shaped the heavens, when I laid the foundations of the earth. Hmm. Job had a similar experience. I'm uh, undone. A <laughs> friend sin did my mother bring me into existence. And then God speaks to Job and he says, now stand up like a man. And I'm going to declare my word to you. And you're going to declare it back to me. Again, a very close example of what we're seeing take place here in Isaiah's life. I am undone. Huh. This being undone, listen, this is not a bad place. It's like I said, repentance isn't a bad thing. I don't say these words to condemn us. But my, my friends, I say, being undone, we've got to be undone to be redone. We've got to be undone of our sin to be redone under his grace. And to pretend like our sin isn't sin and that everything's okay, that's the worst thing we can do because we'll never become undone. And if we're never undone, we'll never be redone. And the fruit will keep coming out. We'll keep spouting the garbage. Mm. We'll keep fixing our eyes on everything other than Christ, the one who's the author and the finisher of our faith. I desire to keep my eyes fixed on him. Being that man of unclean lips, living in the place of uh, uncleanliness. It's like I said many times, this is where we see the final fruit. So we must be individuals who guard our gate. We've got to be individuals who got, guard our eye gate, guard our ear gate. What are you allowing to come into those gates? Right now, at this point, God is just onto Isaiah. He is um, just kind of ah, filling him up, pouring out his holiness, his sovereignty into Isaiah. And this is the automatic response that anybody would have when their gates are, are overwhelmed with the Holy God. And uh, the beauty of this, so Isaiah, undone, ripped apart. But the purpose of God's presence is not simply there to tear us apart. It's got to tear us apart so we can be rebuilt. And at this point in the story, we see the seraphim. Holy, 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 right? But one of them, I believe he continues to cry out, but he goes to the altar. He grabs tongs and grabs a coal from the altar. Understand the beauty of this? Because there's a couple of things from the temple that we see here in the throne room of God. We see the glory of God. His train filling the temple. He's seated on his throne. This is the place of his sovereignty. But now we see the seraphim going to the altar and taking a coal. Taking the tool with which to purify the man. One of the seraphim flew. These angelic beings surrounding the throne of God ministered to Isaiah. One flew with a live coal, which means the coal is still hot. It's still burning. And as a matter of fact, it's not just hot. It's not just burning. We don't see that the seraphim grab it. We see that they take tongs to take hold of it, which means, of course, that it's still hot. And even though it was still so hot from the altar, uh, realized that the pain that Isaiah was experienced, it did not even come when the coal was placed on his lips. 
the pain that Isaiah is experiencing is a sinful man standing in the presence of a holy, holy, holy God. We see God's throne where he rules and reigns. And then we see the altar which is there for us. The place where we can find cleansing, purging, purity. We ought never to confuse the two. Having an experience with the throne of God, right, reveals our inabilities, reveals our sins. Then God has the altar with which to cleanse, to purify, and to wash us. And really what it comes down to, I was talking earlier about uh, which member of the Godhead this really was. I think we see a perfect picture of Jesus in his heavenly form. I believe the individual sitting on that throne, again, we could debate it. It's not a matter of debate. I do not believe it was God the Father. I do not believe it was God the Holy Spirit. But I believe it was God the, God the Son sitting in his sovereignty. And we see the redemptive process of the cross being played out. The seraphim, the burning ones, take the coal. Bring that cleansing power, that holiness, to Isaiah. Hmm. The coal, it cleanses Isaiah's lips. It says, behold... Or the uh, seraphim says, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is now taken away, and your sin is purged. I love that the coal is applied to uh, Isaiah's lips, number one, because that was the unclean gate by which the fruit was coming out. And number two, because we often see that this is the last stop of the seed that has been sown. Not just the coal, but we see the seraphim making the proclamation, the cleansing has already taken place. But we see the seraphim making the declaration of purity over Isaiah. So not just the act of cleansing is taking place, but the declaration, you are now clean. Just in case there was any question, just in case you did not know your sin is purged. Get this, friends. It's so good. Woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live amongst the people of unclean lips. Okay. The seraphim takes the coal, touches his lips, makes the declaration over him. You are now cleansed. You are now pure. Is it because the seraphim needed to know? Is it because God needed to know? No, Isaiah, listen, because what we're, we're coming up on, right? We, we've talked about the presence of God. We've talked about that encounter with God. We've talked about the cleansing that takes place after this encounter. But we're coming to the point of commissioning. We're moving our way through this story to the point where God's going to say, who's going to go for us and who am I going to send? So it was imperative that Isaiah realized that he would have been prepared that he had been made ready. He had been made ready. How he had been made ready? Because he had been placed. He had had an encounter with Almighty God. He had been made ready because that encounter had had an effect on him. That effect had brought out the undoneness. Then God steps in with the purity from the altar, touches his lips, and the declaration is made. Just in case you didn't know Isaiah, you are now cleansed. You are now purified. You are made right. All of this has got to take place. And then God makes brings forth the question who will go for us and who shall we send it's interesting that God's asking this question because we're talking about an omnipotent uh, omniscient omnipotent God all knowing everywhere all the time past present and future and you've heard this uh, so many times I've taught it is God asking the question, who will go for us and who shall we send for his own sake? No. He's asking it for Isaiah's sake. God already knows that Isaiah is going to be the one to go. But Isaiah doesn't know. And now that Isaiah, you have been cleansed, I'm going to make this question. I'm going to invite you, Isaiah, into this partnership. I could make you. I could command you. As a matter of fact, I could, I could send a robot to do it, right? But what I'm doing, even though I already know the answer, I want to afford you the opportunity of having the choice of being able to say, here are my Lord, send me. So I'm going to make this, this, this eternal question come out from the throne. Who will go for us and who shall we send? I am doing this as an open door that you may enter into. That we may enter, though you are inadequate, even in your purged and purified form, though you are still inferior, though you are still a finite being and I am an infinite being, I want you to know that because you've experienced me, Isaiah, because you've entered, because you've had that repentance, because you've been undone, now you're being redone, 
because this has taken place and it has transpired, it is placed you in a position of being partnered finite with that which is infinite. Wow. Wow. My friends, each time we have an experience with Almighty God, it allows us to undergo this process of being undone, to be redone, so that we might be cleansed, purged, purified, so that we might be commissioned, so that we might be those who are sent out. God didn't ask the question because he needed an answer. He asked the question so that Isaiah would have the opportunity to give the answer. He would have the opportunity to become partners with God. He would have the opportunity to say, here am I, Lord, send me. I love it when Isaiah says this because there's absolutely no hesitation. There's no waiting. There's no wondering. There's no, hmm, maybe, um, well, I no. Here am I, Lord, send me. Send me, God. Allow me to be that one who is sent unto the nations. My friend, we've got to take hold of this word. We need to allow the presence of God to bring consecration, purification, so that God may make the declaration of that question, who will go for us and who shall we send? And we might then stand before our Heavenly Father and say, here am I, Lord, send me. What has caused such a faith-filled response? I'm going to tell you what has caused such a faith-filled response. Isaiah's gates had been uh, just lambasted. Huh. They had been wabamified, inundated, submerged, subdued, overtaken, overthrown, captured by the presence of Almighty God. His eyes and his ears had been captured, inundated, overpowered with the presence of God. And whatever comes into those gates at the point of conception will dictate what is birth. Conception taking place in the heart and now the fruit being born. Here am I, Lord to me. Don't care where, doesn't matter where. Don't care what, doesn't matter what. Don't care when, doesn't matter when. When, where, what, how, who, doesn't matter. You say the word, I'm your man. Why? Why? Because my eyes have been changed. My ears have been changed. My heart has been changed. And now my lips are changed. You hear me, friends? The words are not just words that we speak out of our mouths, but I'm going to go ahead and step on some more toes because I love you so much. But there are the words that we express on Twitter. They're the words that we express on Facebook. They're, they're, they're the words that we express in uh, writing, in words that come out of our mouth. All of these things are expressions of what is on the inside of here. We see those expressions played out, huh? whether, again, in writing, in voice, does not matter. And I believe that there are a great many of us who need to allow our gates to be captured. Capture my heart, O oh God. Capture, huh? encircle me. I love the illustration that we see in the book of Hosea. Hosea talks to Gomer, right? And they had, they had been married. They had had children. She had run off. She played the harlot. Hosea is broken. He's messed up. And finally he gets courage. God tells him, makes the declaration, this is what you're going to do. And so he goes to her and he says, I'm going to pin you in. I'm going to encircle you all about. I'm going to capture you. You will not be able to escape. Wow. Friends, your heavenly father is capturing you. He is encircling you. Do not. Listen, this teaching is God saying, it's not me, right? It's his word saying, I want to encircle you. I want to capture you your heart. I want to imprison you in my love. Being imprisoned in God's love, God's purity, God's goodness is so much better than being out there free to roam. Hear me, friends. When those seraphim are declaring, holy, holy, holy is God. God's holiness is similar to God's love. God's love is holy. God's faith is holy. God's goodness is holy. Everything comes out of God's love in holiness. Holiness and love work hand in 
And you can't have holiness absent love. You can't have love absent holiness. Isaiah declares, Here am I, Lord, send me no hesitation, but absolute faith. Why? Because his gates had been captured. They had been imprisoned. Much as I desire for our Heavenly Father to imprison me. And as much as I desire for him to capture me. For him to take hold. For him to kata lambanu. For him to take hold of that for which he has taken hold of me. Seized me. And our Heavenly Father has indeed done that. My friends, listen. We still got a lot more to go. We got to talk about here am I, Lord. Not just um, here am I. That's the first declaration. But then send me. And then God makes the declaration over him where he is to go, what he is to do. And there's so much more, so much more there as acts of obedience, as acts of that uh, holy contrition, as we see the seraphim doing. But I don't have enough time this week to go into that. So I promise you, we will continue at the point of here am I, Lord, send me next week. Come on, allow this word to burn in our hearts. Allow the seed that's been sown into our eyes tonight, into our ears tonight, in the name of Jesus, allow it to take root in our heart so that we might come to the point of allowing those things, those areas that are impure, unclean, unholy, allow those things to be cleansed, purified, so that we might come to the point today of saying, here am I, Lord send me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Ooh, Father, what a prophetic preaching and teaching for this day, this time, for this hour. Father, as I look at the time of Isaiah and the time in which we now live, I see so many similarities, God. So many similarities. And Father, the the good news is this. I see the people of God arising and uh, making that declaration. I'm a man. I'm a woman of unclean lips and I live amongst a nation of individuals of unclean lips. Father, I believe that that this prophetic word has brought about a level of conviction, kingdom conviction, uh, a level of individuals getting uncomfortable and saying, woe is me, I am undone. But friends, listen, I, I have not taught this message or preached this sermon to make you comfortable. I've preached it, I've taught it to make you very uncomfortable. That is okay. Because that brings us to the place of allowing a little bit of undoneness to take place. So God, I pray in the name of Jesus, let us become a little bit more undone so that we might be redone in your image. For that is our desire. That is our prayer. So may the Lord bless you. May he keep you and cause the light of hope, the light of that glorious countenance, that Isaiah six countenance to shine upon you. That his burning ones, his seraphim would declare over you, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And you would walk and be undone the rest of this week. Father, let us take hold of the truths. Live by them, walk by them. In Jesus' name, amen.